how did you see it? Yeah. Do you want to do a little, little shock, yeah. little rush? Yeah, sure. So I had a question from my work on finding the point of intersection of something. I can't see if I remember it right. Um, one sign and a sign. Who remembers the problem? Uh, mine was two parentheses, one minus cosine theta. Mm -hmm. And over here was four sine of theta? Yeah. And our job was to find the point of intersection, so we set them equal to each other. So our task is essentially to solve this yeah. equation. Yeah. All right, geometrically, in the polar plane, what are we looking for the point of intersection between two polar curves? What kind of polar curves do we have? Okay, what's the graph of this one? Circle. And where is this circle? It's on the y axis of a diameter four. And this thing? Also a cardioid. Keep in mind this here, it's going to be a cardioid. We're going to find a couple of points of intersection. So we'll do the intersection first, then we'll draw the picture and see if we even need to do anything else. Okay, so I see that common factor of two, and I just want to get rid of it. Gone. Now, if this one weren't here, then I would put the sine and the cosine together and make a tangent, and then I can figure that out from there. One of your web work problems was like that. You can put your sine and cosine, but divided by cosine, you get a tangent, and then you use an inverse tangent. Okay. And Trig, I know one of the techniques of solving trig equations is try to get the same trig function of the same angle. So I've got to use a trig identity. My trig identity that relates sines and cosines is the Pythagorean identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So I need to get some squares in here. So at this stage of the game, I'm going to square both sides. So my goal is to eventually use the Pythagorean identity. But that has squares, so I've got to square both sides to get those in there. So when I square the left-hand side, I get one minus two cosine theta plus the cosine squared of theta. And on the right-hand side, I get four sine squared of theta. And since I have a cosine to the first power, I'm going to replace the sine squared function. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So sine squared is one minus cosine squared. And now I see a bunch of cosine squareds. I have a second degree equation in terms of cosine. I'm going to try to write that like I would a second degree equation in terms of x. I'm going to get a zero on one side and try to factor. So I'm going to distribute the four, move everything to one side, and then take it from there. So when I distribute the four, I'm going to have minus four cosine squared. I'm going to move it over and add it to this one to get a total of five cosine squareds. Then this is my only cosine to the first power. I'll write it next. Now I want you to distribute the four and then combine the numbers and tell me what number do you get? Negative three. three. You get a negative three. I get a positive four here, subtract that from one. So I want to know if I can factor that. And so I'm going to pull it up, I guess. No, that way's not very good either, but I'll try. I'll try to pull it up here. To get the five cosine squared, I'll put a five cosine of theta times a cosine of theta. And now I need factors of three placed in such a way that I get a middle term of a minus two. So I couldn't possibly put the three here. That gives me too much in the middle. So I've got to put the three here and the one there. That gives me three cosine theta. That gives me five cosine theta. I need a negative two cosine theta. So I need a minus here and a plus there.
And now I set each factor equal to zero and solve for theta. So I'll set the first factor equal to zero, I get five. Cosine theta plus three is zero. And cosine of theta is a negative three fifths. Is, I think it's negative three and positive one uh, because the two is negative. Two is negative, right? So I need the bigger product to be negative. Right. Isn't that bigger than that one? Yeah, okay. So I got them okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm... Okay. Always I'm check me. All right, I don't know that angle exactly. So I'm just going to write that as in the inverse cosine of negative three fifths. And I think for web work, you need to write arc cosine. Let's get the other theta. This says cosine of theta is equal to one. Cosine of what angle is one? Zero. And they already told us they're going to intersect at the pole. That theta is equal to zero. And R is zero because these values are R's. So to find R, I'm going to substitute those in here. So when theta is the arc cosine of um, negative three fifths, I get this composite function. I assume web work will take that answer, but I know again, I am teaching trig this semester. So I know that can be simplified. The arc cosine of negative three fifths represents an angle. Since this number is negative and the cosine is only defined between zero and pi, it represents an angle in quadrant two that I would take the cosine of to get negative three fifths. The cosine of this particular angle is negative three fifths. So this is the angle. Cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. What's this leg going to be to satisfy the Pythagorean theorem? So what's the sine of this angle? Four fifths. So this becomes R is equal to four times four fifths, which is 16 fifths. So your ordered pair is the arc cosine of negative three fifths is theta and 16 fifths is R. This other one gives you R is zero because the sine of zero is zero. They already told you it was gonna intersect at the pole. So now let's draw the picture. We already know this one. So let's get this picture here. Let's graph R is equal to two times one minus the cosine of theta. So let's just look at some of the quadrantial angles. What's the value of R here when theta is equal to zero? Uh, zero. Because the cosine of zero is one. So there's the point at the pole. What's the value of R when theta is pi halves? Two. Two. Let's say that that's two. What's the value of R when theta is pi? This cosine of pi is negative one, so this adds to two, so it gives me four. So if that's two and four is out here somewhere, what do you think the rest of the picture looks like? And then it's your heart kind of shape. Like that. And we said this other guy has a center at zero, two, and a diameter of four. So it does something like this. Something like that. And I know that this part is inside this part, otherwise we would have found more points of intersection. We only found a point of intersection in quadrant two, right? The arc cosine of the negative three fifths. That's this guy right here. That angle is the arc cosine of negative three fifths. And this angle here is the other point of intersection. So this cardioid fits inside the circle. 
So can you tell me what integral I would need to find the area in the circle but outside the cardioid? Um, so it would be the top graph minus the bottom graph from the left point of intersection to the right point of intersection. So if we're circular, so talk to me circles. Right. So there's no top and bottom. There's an outer radius and an inner radius and angle to angle, right? Mm -hmm. So area in the circle outside the cardioid. All right, what's the formula for area in general of a polar curve? One half times N C roll of F theta squared. That's right. I need a one half. I need an F of theta squared. So I'm going to do outer radius squared minus inner radius squared times the one half. So that area is going to look like one half the integral of the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. So my outer radius, draw my little ray through the region, is always going to be the circle. And my inner radius is always going to be the cardioid. So I put the formula for the circle first. That was the four sine of theta. Then I put the cardioid. And the numbers that I found is the points of intersection. Those thetas go here. So I'm reading from zero to the arc cosine of negative three fifths. Any problem with finishing it from there? Good. I was having trouble um, with kind of a similar problem okay. where I think you have to integrate in two parts with like a linear line splicing through the middle. Okay, the two circles? Uh, yeah, R equals three cosine theta and R equals six sine theta. That's right. That's right. That's how I wanted to do that one. So let's do it. You just find the angle of the line. Um, yes. Let's see why we need two integrals. Um, so R is equal to say the two problems. Three cosine theta and R equals six sine theta. And we're supposed, supposed to find the area common to both. Uh, yes, ma'am, I believe so. And the problem asks, also asks for the point of intersection. Which, which we would need anyway. So cosine by itself is a circle that's symmetric to the x-axis. The sine by itself is the circle symmetric to the y-axis. The number in front is the diameter. So I've got a bigger circle up on the y-axis, a smaller circle on the x-axis, and they're going to intersect. Let me draw a big picture. So I gotta get my sine curve bigger. So let's say that that's the diameter of six. There's the sine curve or the sine egg. If that's a six, then three is about that big. And so the cosine circle looks like that. Where this number is three and this number is six. And so the region common to them is in here. And there is a point of intersection that's important because in that region that's common to them, it doesn't look terribly symmetric. A little more air in that other circle. That point of intersection we need, let's find it now by setting these two equations equal to one another. 
So three cosine theta is equal to six sine theta. Again, we have two different trig functions. You can do that deal about squaring both sides to get the Pythagorean identity in here, or you can just write in terms of a tangent, whichever you feel more comfortable to do. I think since the squaring worked so well last time, maybe we'll do that again. Let me try it. Let's set them equal to one another and then square both sides. So if we square both sides, we get nine cosine squared theta is 36 sine squared theta. Then replace one of those with one minus the square of the other one. Would it be better just to square the three? Oh, duh. I'm going to go ahead and divide the three now. So I'll divide the nine. Nine goes into 36 four times. About that. I don't know why I didn't see that. Okay, so maybe, maybe I will replace. I don't care which one you replace. You like sines or cosines better? Cosines. Like cosines. Like cosines. So I'll replace the sine squared with one minus cosine squared. Now let's put them together. I'm going to have minus four of them here. I've got positive one of them there. So when I move that over, I'll have five of them here. And that leaves me four over there. So I have that the cosine squared of theta is four fifths. Um, it's gonna be a first quadrant angle. Here's our picture. So I'll just take the positive square root. So I get the cosine of theta is two divided by the square root of five. And that makes theta the inverse cosine of two divided by the square root of five. Is there an arc cosine squared? Like, is that, or do you just always square root? Yeah, you take okay. the square root. So that's that angle right there. That angle was needed because I have a region that's not simple in terms of subdividing this with rays. Take that region that is in red, but below my little, what color would this be? I don't know. Pink or purple? What color is that? Purpley pink? Magenta. Magenta. <laughs> below the magenta line, if you were to partition that with rays, they'll all hit this part of the curve. Agree? That's the sine curve. But once I cross that ray, they hit the cosine curve. So I don't have a simple region in terms of partitioning it like that. I've got to do two integrals to get this area. And they don't appear to be symmetric, so I can't find one and double it. Okay, so I gotta do two integrals. What does that black line mean? The black line is how far I can write. How clever. So don't write here. So let's go that way. I'm going to take this way and I write my two integrals that give us the area. So I'm going to integrate for my first region the integral from zero to the arc cosine of two over the square root of five. I need my one half. There it is right there. And then my f of theta squared. So which circle am I using here? The, no, the bottom one. That's the sine curve. So I'm using six sine of theta all squared. Then the second one picks up from the arc cosine of two over the square root of five and takes me to where? Uh, pi over two. Pi over two is correct. And there I've got three cosine, I've got another one half, f of theta squared. Okay. 
Is there anything carried away? Okay with the integration or should I do it? Yes, sir. I'm not going to lie. I don't know why you um, chose the six sine theta squared first for that integral. Like, did you? Because if I'm below that angle and I partition this region with rays from the origin, oh, okay. The rays are going to hit the circle that is the sine curve. But once I cross that line, my rays hit my cosine curve. Got it. Okay. All good? So you're going to have a funny looking answer that's going to have some other junk in it. Okay. Can we write okay. this very good? I think, yeah, it's not your favorite number, but I could, I could do it. I can, I can get a fraction out of that. You're going to have to eventually use a double angle formula for the sine. Because, right, when you integrate a sine squared and a cosine squared, you get a double angle formula for the sine. And I know the double angle formula for the sine. I'm going to do it. <laughs> it's because I want you to see what a math goddess I am. <laughs> that sounds like a sounds like an outstanding idea. idea. Like that. Like an outstanding idea. I'm going to kind of crank up the heat, though. I'm going to move through it fast. Oh. Okay. Okay. So here I'm integrating 36 sine squared theta. Here's the 36. Then the integral of sine squared. Do you have that formula memorized? I yes, it does Right. What's the two. integral of sine squared? One minus. I'm going to skip the one minus part. I'm going straight to the integral of that. And then here we have the sine of two theta over four. And then I have to evaluate that from zero to the arc cosine of two of the square root of five. So let's hold off on that for now. Let me finish here. I'm going to rewrite the sine of two theta as two sine theta cosine theta. I'm going to go ahead and take half of 36 and get 18. Okay, so this is a trig identity. If I cancel the two here, both of these have a common factor of a half. I'm going to take that common factor of a half divide out the 18 and get nine. So I canceled that. And now I'm gonna replace each, this is the arc cosine of two fifths. Now I know each of these is gonna be zero at theta zero. So this first term just becomes the arc cosine of two over the square root of five. I canceled that too get the nine. Here I have minus the sine of the arc cosine of two over the square root of five. And then I have the cosine of the arc cosine of two over the square root of five. What is the cosine of the arc cosine of any angle? Gives you the angle, right? Then again, this represents an angle that I would take the cosine of to get two over root five. So that stuff in the parentheses represents an angle that I take the cosine of to get two over the square root of five. So it gives me the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. I need the opposite side so that I can take the sine of that angle. So two squared plus one squared is the square root of five squared. So this side is one. And that means the sine of this angle is one over root five. So I'm gonna get nine times the arc cosine of two over root five. This I said was one over root five. And that's two over root five. So you can write that last fraction as two fifths. Now let's go and collect the other integral. So now I'm going to do this part. And so I get the square of three is nine, put it out here, I'm going to get nine halves. Now I'm integrating cosine squared, and I get the same thing with a plus.
Now I'm going to use that same identity and cancel the twos. Okay, now what? Now I've got to put in the pi halves. I'm going to take that common factor of a half out front and make that a nine fourths. It's my top right there. There I get plus nine over four. So the twos came out and went to there. Pi halves is going in. Cosine of pi halves is zero. So I'm just going to get pi halves out of that. And now I have to subtract what I get when I put this in there. So I'm going to have an arc cosine of two over root five. Then I get the same deal that I got over there, right? Sine of the arc cosine, cosine of the arc cosine, and it should give me uh, two, two fifths. So that's going to be plus two fifths. And so I'm going to add this number with that number. Let's see what I got here. I got nine of these guys. Can you uh, combine the, the one over root pi? Yeah, that's that where I get the two fifths. That's two oh, fifths. Okay. I just didn't write it here because it gets off the camera. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to do the arithmetic. I have nine arc cosines minus nine fourth arc cosines. So nine minus nine fourths. Nine minus nine fourths. Four times nine is 36. And 27 fourths. 27 fourths of those arc cosines of that funny number, 27 I said. <laughs> All right, then what's left? I have two fifths times nine. So that's minus 18 fifths. And I have nine fourths times two fifths. That'll cancel there. Put me a two. I get for roots of five, not six. No, the, the um they the multiply. Okay. And so I was now I got to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have. Minus 18 over 5 here, and this times that gives me 18 over 20, which is 9 fifths, and I have a minus 9 fifths. 18 over 20 is 9 tenths. Who wanted to finish? So I got to do it here. 9 tenths. 9 tenths. 9 tenths. <laughs> nine tenths. I got a minus. So this is. 36 tenths, a negative 36 tenths, minus 9 tenths, a negative. Yeah, oh, minus. Oh, okay. 45, 45, 45 tenths. Here's where we stop the problem. So that's negative 9, <laughs> negative 27 tenths. Negative 9 tenths. Yes. I don't believe you. And then I saw also have a 9 pi over 8. Here's our exact answer. Give or take the one thing that wasn't trick. <laughs> I don't know what that number is in the middle. I stopped thinking at that point. I'm pretty sure we got to the right conclusion. Yeah. But if you put the numbers in here and just left them as composite functions, I'd be happy as well. So if we make that kind of mistake on a test, is that like failure? No, 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 no. That's yeah. just human. Human. So we put our answer as a decimal? Kill you. <laughs> How would you know the decimal that is? You just, you just do. Oh, yeah. My favorite. We're not going to use calculators. Everybody's like, long division. Why not? Long division. Why? It just they adds extra easy. time to the problem. Uh, See, now if you want to use a calculator, you have to waste time. <laughs> they go on to the I next just one. Plug that into my that is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. A lot of calculators can do it from here. 
Yeah. But there's a lot of times you get to a test and you're like, I know like two times three is six, but I gotta make sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and it wastes your time. But it makes you more correct. No, it makes those muscles up here flabby and saggy. <laughs> you don't want flabby, saggy brain muscles. Will they be? Yes, sir. Not negative, not negative. Well, no. <laughs> what is it? Twenty-seven tenths. Twenty-seven tenths. Uh, Put your favorite fraction yes. here. Plus C. We had trouble doing fractions. The rest plus is C. plus C. <laughs> it would okay. Be what else do you need to know about polar coordinates and polar graphs? Yeah. What are they? I'm just kidding. What are they? <laughs> Tasty little treats. We ended class on Friday by deriving the formula for the arc length of a rectangular defined curve. It came from the distance formula and the summation symbol <laughs> and our Riemann sum. Well, I don't want to derive it again. I want to just practice using it. We oh, denote we the practice. length of a curve with the lowercase letter S. So this is section 6.4. We'll look at arc length. This black is just not going to cut it. We have more black markers in here on the board. Um, the board. Oh, there you go. The, the, the really bad the environment there actually for See, um, there's a bit in this section that talks about surface area. Arc length is a two dimensional quantity, so I could use the distance formula. Surface area is like if I were to paint something and I need to know the area that I'm going to paint, so I wouldn't be using some sort of um, distance formula, I got to derive that formula a little bit more complicated. It gives a formula that's almost unusable in calculus two. Um, but when you cover the same thing in calculus three, you get a really easy formula to do the same thing. So I used to cover it in calculus two just to say, look how easy this is going to be for you in Cal three. But then by the time we get to it in Cal three, everybody forgot that I did it in Cal two and had a really difficult integral. So I just don't even do it anymore. You'll do surface area integrals in Cal 3 in a much easier way. Right? It's hard to do two, three dimensional things with something that's a two dimensional tool. So we're just going to do arc length. So we're finding the length around along the curve. That's y is equal to f of x in rectangular coordinates from x is equal to a with ordered pair x1, y1 over to x is equal to b with ordered pair x2, y2. And what we do is we cut it up into an infinite number of points and use the distance formula where if I call this the kth sub interval, that the length along the kth sub interval, if those two points are close enough together, is essentially a straight line. So I, Use the distance formula, which was x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared under the square root sign. And we got something like this. I divided everything by delta xk squared, which is the same as factoring out a delta xk. So we were able to rewrite that kth partitioning element. I said I wasn't going to derive it again, but I am. I divide or factor out a delta xk squared. It comes out to here. As it's just a delta xk to the first power. Then we're going to do a bunch of those put it in a summation symbol and take a limit as delta x goes to zero. So let me ask you this. What did the mean value theorem say in calculus one? 
What that old mean value theorem say? That's what mean value the theorem rate, said? The average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change. That's right. Here's the average rate of change over the case subinterval. At some point, it's equal to the instantaneous rate of change, which we know now is the derivative. So this number is really y prime as I take the limit and make the Riemann sum. So this thing added all together with the limit in the Riemann sum um, with the limit of the Riemann sum, we get the overall arc length to be a definite integral as a function of x, the overall arc length is the definite integral of the square root of one plus y prime or f of x all squared. This becomes dx. We're doing this as a function of x. So we're going from our x1 to, I should have used a f of a and b f of b. So we'll integrate from a to b. Is it um, f prime? Okay. That is f prime. Thank you. And then I showed you that mechanically that can be a difficult integral to compute unless we had somewhat of a contrived bunch of examples where we were able to work around that square root sign. And so here's one of them. One of them, got it marked in here. Um, um, so when I want to do, I thought I had it marked. Put this. Well, I'm just going to have to grab one out of here. Okay, so let's let y equal, let's see, x cubed divided by 24 plus 2 over x. And let's find the length of the curve. This curve from x is equal to one to x is equal to two. So our formula calls for the derivative. Let's take the derivative real quick. The derivative here is three x squared over 24. The three divides into the 24 eight times. So how about x squared over eight? What's the derivative of two over x? Minus two. Think of that as x to the negative one. So it's negative two x to the negative two or negative two over x squared. You know why? You know why? I added one. Right? You did. You did. So you're taking the derivative of that as two x to the negative one with the power rule. Okay, now let's put that into the formula. And so our arc length is found by computing a definite integral from x is one to x is two of I want one plus f prime squared in here. So one plus that guy squared. That looks like fun, doesn't it? Yep. And we do, we do have to square it. 
I want you to square it first. I want you to see what you get when you square x squared over eight minus two over x squared. That happened. I touched nothing. This room is haunted. He, I think Jack did it just to get you off. I know I wanted you to feel useful today. I, I, I was kind of, kind of, kind of, in a bump. I can see, I can see yeah. you needed a boost. I appreciate it. He needs a boost because I'm all over there. <laughs> Let's see. All right, you done squaring mud and white germs? Anybody? Almost. Did derivatives and now algebra. A few minutes ago, we were adding fractions. This is a scary day. All right, I got it. I, think I, I got did it. it. You think you have it? I'm pretty confident. Fractions. Okay. Tell me what you got. X to the fourth over 64. Okay. Minus one half. I got, I got minus eight. Yeah, I got minus eight to four over X to oh, the fourth. Y'all are right. It is minus one half. Dang it. Okay, thank you. Um, All right, who needs help getting that middle term? Yeah, excellent. I know what I did. I just flipped the fractions around. All right, the middle term is twice this product. So that product, the x squared will cancel when you get two over eight, two over eight is one fourth, twice one fourth is a half with the sign of that middle term. Boom. Whew, got that algebra out of the way. Almost. I'm going to take these parentheses away and I'm going to add one to a half. Go to the minus one half. Did my door lock again? I thought this two touch thing was supposed to work. Sorry. That's my bad. I'm moving. Uh uh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we didn't want to get up early. <laughs> you guys remind me to bring my ID with me so I can unlock my own door. But the two touch thing doesn't work. They sent us an email saying they're going to lock all the smart rooms, but they'll be open from eight to five. We forgot this one. Oh, should do it. Okay, so I'm adding these two together. I'm going to put it in descending order again. And it looks like this. I got the square root of x to the fourth over 64 plus one half plus four over x to the fourth dx. So what's the big problem? It's really ugly. It's really ugly. We can't do that as a UDU integral. But my hint to you is the problems in this section are contrived so that if they're not UDU integrals, then the stuff under the square root sign, if you've done the algebra properly, is a perfect square. That stuff factors as a perfect square, mimicking what we started with here. When you squared that, you got a minus one half and the same guy, same guy. Oh, not so what do you think I squared to get it with a plus one half? I squared over eight, eight plus two over x. That's right. That factors as x squared over eight plus two over x, all squared. And that's kind of handy because now we can take the square root of the perfect square. This is a positive number in this interval. So the square root of that just leaves me the stuff under the need there. You with me? And so I have to compute the integral. So that cancels that, leaving me the integral of x squared over eight plus two over x dx from one to two. So look for that. Look for getting a perfect square if you've got more than uh, more terms under here. You've got three terms exactly. It's not two over x squared. Yeah. It is two over x squared. It is, because that's an x to the fourth. So we're going to integrate these. I can integrate each of them with the power rule. I 
write them like that to help you integrate them. Add one to the power, divide by the new power. So this becomes x cubed over three. The over three is gonna combine with the one over eight, give me one over 24. This becomes x to the negative one over negative one. So I'm gonna write that as minus two over x to the first power from one to two. And now I'm gonna put the numbers in. Two cubed is eight, eight over 24 is one third. Two over two is one. Put a one in there and I get one over 24 minus two. That's as far as I wanna go. I think that should be a positive number, so I think we're okay. Two, that's one. Yeah, I'm eight minus one and seven over 24 that for mixed fractions here. Just want to make sure it was positive. Okay. So we're all going to work out so that we'll be able to do that radical sign to this point in the game. So that's something we know how to integrate from Cal 1. Let's do one more and then we'll go into color coordinates. Yes. Maybe I should do that already since we're running out of time. We get out of here at 45. Oh, I got time. I could do one more. Thank you. I never know what I can and can't do in this class. I can do everything except <laughs> shut that off. That's my job. So that it doesn't matter. I'm an extension. <laughs> Um, so, 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 how about we look at oh, goodness, that one looks frightening. I guess that means we should do it. It's, the scary one. Yeah. it's better to take the scary ones in class. Okay, we're going to find the arc length of this is going to be fun. I'm kind of excited. I'm getting a little tingly feeling all over. Let's do the same for f of x. Who's going to freak you guys out? Uh -oh. e to the 2x here, minus 1. And that's not it. Minus the inverse secant of e to the x. Oh, I knew as soon as she said it's going to be. And we're going to integrate this by the arc length on the interval from zero to the natural log of two. I don't think I've ever seen arc or inverse secant before. Ever? I don't think so. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to take its derivative. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. okay, so do the same for. Let me write that formula a little bit higher so I got more room to work. Formula has a square root, one plus an F prime square. That's our goal. So you got to take the derivative of that thing. That square root sign there is a one half power. So we get a little chain rule action here. Bring the power down, raise it to one power less, multiply by the derivative of what's inside. Okay. So let's put f prime over here. Bring the power down, raise it to one power less, multiply by the derivative of what's inside. What's the derivative of e to the 2x minus 1? 2e to the 2x. Right. Happy with that? All right, somebody in here remembers the formula for the derivative of the inverse secant of u. One, one over the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus one. I'm wow. Sure. That. All, All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> one over the absolute value of u times the square root of x squared minus one. one minus u squared. Who did that? Who knew that one? It was a. Uh, you looked it up? Yeah. <laughs> I got some okay. I was waiting for you guys to say it. I was about to. I was about to guess. 
You're about to guess? One over something times the square root of something. <laughs> and you've been dang close. Because yep. there's a something, there's a square yeah. root of something. More than I know. Was today a sleep in day and nobody told me? All right. It's okay. The rest of us can make up for it right now. And thank goodness. I won't go to sleep and make it. I can't sleep now. I'm kind of I'm excited about this. <laughs> so, so I've got the now we're over there. R U is e to the x. I don't need absolute values on an e to the x because e to the x is always positive. So we get one over e to the x times the square root of one minus. Oh, I forgot something. Let me try. One over e to the x times the square root of one minus e to the x all squared, and then the derivative of e to the x. Which just, yeah. There we go. So let's put that over here. We're making the derivative here. There's a minus one over e to the x square root of one minus e to the x all squared. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. <laughs> what is e to the x all squared going to look like? E to, e to 2x. So let's simplify. These twos cancel. This goes in the denominator. This is going to stay on top. So I get e to the 2x up here. That's going to go on the bottom as a positive one half power. Oops, I wrote that backwards. This should be u squared minus one. I think I a match. So this is e to the x squared minus one. So they both have the same denominator, in other words. But here, this one cancels with that one. So I, they have the same denominator. I can put them together. I can put them together, and it looks like this e to the 2x minus 1, that's not in the power, get down there. If you jump up there to the power, you silly little one. <laughs> and then here. And I recognize that as being reducible. I have e to the 2x minus 1 to the first power on top, e to the 2x minus 1 to the 1 half power on the bottom. So how does that simplify? Yeah. That's right. So f prime in this example simplifies all the way to this. That doesn't look so bad anymore. I told you these are so contrived from the beginning so that now when I put it in here, look how pretty this is going to be when I put that in there. Well, our arc length integral, we're going to go from zero to the natural log of two, square root one plus our f prime squared. Give me the simplifying steps and tell me what all that mess simplifies to. The x. Refer to e to the two x. Which is? Square. E to the x. Yeah, which is just e to the x. E to the 2x. E to the x, not even e to the 2x. It'll be an e to the x, because I square this radical sign first. Gets rid of the radical sign. I have e to the 2x minus 1 plus 1 is e to the 2x. Now I got that radical sign. The square root of e to the 2x is just e to the x, because I raise a power to a power by multiplying exponents. So we just have to integrate e to the x. You know how long it took the author of this book to, make to figure out an integral that we can do? What's, what simplifies to e to the x after we do all that? I got mad respect. <laughs> What's integral b to the x? E to the x. This is a little reward for the punishment we had to endure. What's e to the natural log of two? Yeah. two. Let's eat at zero. One. And what's the arc length? One. Is that awesome that we have this wacky curve? And from here to here, the arc length is one unit. 
Oh, oh, we're this easy. That's <laughs> not inside. This part here was the cow one. Right? You all live through cow one because you're here. It's a scary kind of cow one. Yeah, it's like nightmare. nightmare. I would never have worked this problem in a regular calculus two class because people would be on their computer dropping the class right now. <laughs> you're there saying, give me another one of those. <laughs> Right? I can tell by looking in your eyes. I want another one of those. Or is it too late to drop? I want another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> too late to drop? <laughs> it is. Today's the last day to drop. Today's the last day to drop. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Today is September. Yeah, got twelve days. It's like a twelve days of Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Each day we have to open up a new gift. So does that mean we have to go over to six five in that time as well? Yeah. What, what will we finish with six five? Okay. Okay. So we'll problems like this be on next. I don't give her an idea. I, I hope I'm I'm like. 11 and a half days from making up the exam. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we're in the same boat. Okay. Well, if y'all just remember um, this problem, if you see either this, like whatever that is, the top, just remember just that is one. one. Just, yeah. just skip all the middle skip. <laughs> don't show any work. Just put one. What's the circumference of a circle I'm talking about? Pi R. Pi R. Circumference is 2 pi r. So suppose I know the radius of my circle. And I only want to find the length of a particular arc well, subtended by an angle of measure theta. I just want to know how long it is from here to here. Well, I take 2 pi r and I divide it by what fraction of the entire circle that is, right? So that's a theta over 2 pi fraction. So this arc length. That arc length is 2 pi r times theta over 2 pi. So the 2 pi is canceled. So s is r theta is the length of an arc of a circle subtended by an angle of theta. That's going to help us to find the formula for the arc length of a polar curve. Because what we're going to do in polar coordinates is take our polar curve and instead of cutting up into little line segments, cut it up into teeny tiny arcs. We're going to erase all this. We try to be neater. Neater. Neat. This is sloppy. Yeah, she's going to be meaner and add a few more. Inverse trig function. <laughs> take that, that equation and add a one to it, which <laughs> would be and neater. I want to be neater in my writing. So let's look at determining arc length and polar coordinates. So we've got some sort of polar curve. Um, R is some function of theta. We want to find, say, the length of the arc. Let's say here's the pole. So that's theta is equal to A, missed my dot. I said I was going to be neater, and I'm not. So I may as well just be meaner. Here's another option. That would be? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Therapy. Therapy. Liquid therapy kind of gal. <laughs> I, I love college sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Only sometimes. That little red segment is what I want to find out how long it is. So we're going to partition this into itty bitty teeny tiny arcs. Each of them have some version of that. So 
So let's make a little itty bitty teeny tiny arc. I'm going to kind of relate it to what we've done. So let's take a little portion of it. Let me just take a little bit here and blow it up a thousand times for the human eye to see. So there's a little portion of it. And I've got that R and it's the same. Essentially, that's gonna be the same circle. So that'll be about the same. And that's gonna be about a delta theta. Delta theta, I said. I should have made that bigger, I didn't. And so this is what I'm looking to find, delta S here. So I'm gonna make a right triangle somehow. I'm gonna come in this way and take a right angle here, drop the perpendicular down so that this piece is a little delta R segment. That should connect, there we go. There's our right triangle there and there. But I want that black line, which is the hypotenuse of that tiny right triangle to roughly approximate the little curvy red arc. Uh, that's a those? delta R, but I wrote it sideways. So oh, let's okay. write it this way. Delta R is this piece. And so that's the hypotenuse. This then could be thought of as R times the cosine of delta theta. And so this would be like R times the sine of delta theta, right? And so, so the delta theta small, delta theta small, Delta S may be thought of as the hypotenuse of a right triangle with sides of Delta R And it's roughly the arc length. So how about R delta theta? So that this length is roughly going to be that length. And R delta theta. I didn't draw my picture so pretty. But anyway, if that's true, then that hypotenuse has the length. So our hypotenuse delta S has the length of leg squared plus leg squared. And so I can write that as delta R squared plus R squared delta theta squared. And I'm gonna factor out a delta theta squared. And if I factor out a delta theta squared, I'm gonna have a delta R over a delta theta squared. Factoring this out of here, so that just leaves an R squared. The common factor of delta theta squared gives me a delta theta outside here. And so if we make the Riemann sum, do this all the way through here, has the form, of a limit as, let's see what I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use n goes to infinity, the sum from k is equal to one to n. What's changing here is the r's and the delta thetas. So this becomes a square root of delta r, my counter is on the r's and the thetas.
So again, the change in R over the change in theta is the change in the dependent function, the dependent variable over the change in the independent variable. So when I run that limit, I can use the mean value theorem again, and this becomes R prime. So I have an R prime squared plus an R squared times the D theta in an integral sign. And so for polar coordinates, we get that the total arc length is an integral from theta is equal to A, to theta is equal to B of the square root. You'll usually see it written in the other order, R squared first, and then R prime squared second. So it's a little bit different. I don't have a one plus F prime that I had before. You have an R squared in there. Let's try this on something that we already know the length of an R. Let's try this on a circle. Let's see if we can do it. But there's our, another new formula. That's the arc length and polar coordinates. Well, for example, let's see if this is usable. Let's find the length of R is equal to four sine theta from theta is equal to zero to theta is pi halves. Let's do it with common sense. Let's do it with our formula. What's the graph of four sine theta look like? The circle on the y-axis. Circle on the y-axis of diameter four. So I'm asking just for the arc length of the right half of that circle from zero to pi over two. I want this arc length here. So you're going to find the total arc length. The diameter is four. So the total length around a circle of diameter four is four pi. So the red part there should have a length of two pi. So total circumference. is pi times diameter. So this arc length is two pi. Let's see if our formula is gonna give us two pi. So R is four sine theta, what's R prime? Derivative sine is, okay, now let's fill that into the formula. I need an R squared and I need the R prime squared and I need to add them together. Zero to pi halves under the square root sign, R has to be squared. So I'm gonna put the four sine theta here. And then I add to it R prime all squared. And then I got to somehow be able to integrate that. Can we kind of think ahead and see whether or not we're going to be able to integrate that? Because a Pythagorean identity. That's right. Both of them are going to have a factor of 16 in front of them. And then I'm going to have a sine squared plus cosine squared. So this thing inside the integral gives me 16 times the sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta. And everybody knows that sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So I just have the square root of 16 right there. Square root of 16 is four. You got to integrate four with respect to theta. Which is? 
X is a theta. And then when I stick in the zero, I get zero. But when I stick in the pi over two, we get two pi. So I wasn't making that formula up. I kind of just copied it out of the book. We saw like, how awesome that book is with that last example. For like our quizzes and stuff or tests, I guess, will we have to know how to derive these formulas? No. Like, I just hope that when I derive them, it helps you remember them. Both of them came from this one with the hypotenuse of a right triangle, which is got a square root sign in it. It's the Pythagorean theorem. The distance formula is the Pythagorean theorem. So that's going to help you remember the square root sign. Students often make a mistake and put a minus here. But in the Pythagorean theorem, there's a plus, right? So now that you've seen it derived as a Pythagorean theorem step, you, you'll remember that, you'll remember that, and you'll remember the squares. So that's primarily why I derive the formulas. Are we going to need to memorize all these formulas for the Absolutely. Test? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so let's grab one that's not so basic. You'll see again that we get integrals that we can't do. I look at a cardioid. Let's try to find the length of the arc around a cardioid and see if we run into any trouble with that square root sign as being part of our formula. So let's take the cardioid we did earlier. R is equal to two times the quantity one minus cosine of theta. Let's see if we can find the length all the way around there. Find the length of the arc around R is equal to two times one minus the cosine of theta. So we know that cardioid, we graphed it a few minutes ago, but when theta was zero, we're at zero, and then it went out like that. So to get all the way around that cardioid, we have to integrate from zero to two pi. Now we got the square root sign. We get to take our R and square it. We also have to take the R prime and square it. So let's take the derivative of that as a function of theta. What's the derivative of two times one minus the cosine of theta? Sine theta. Two sine theta. Go inside, the derivative of one is zero. The derivative of cosine is minus the sine. That makes a plus sine times two. And so I'm going to write the formula down again to help you remember it. And here we've got to have an r squared added to an r prime squared, both as functions of theta. all the way around the circle from zero to two pi. R was two times one minus the cosine of theta. We're gonna take that and square it and add it to two sine of theta and square it. So carefully do the squaring and see what happens. So far, you got something like that. I'm going to take the four out front as the square root of four and just put a two out front. I'm going to take this four and that four, take the square root of it, and get two. 
because it's a common factor. So that's factoring out the four in a product, I can take the square root of it. So then I've got a cosine squared plus a sine squared. So I know that's one, but I got another one in there. So now I got two. I got two minus two cosine theta. Can you integrate that? Hmm. No. Hmm. A half angle identity. Let me scribble over here and see if I can remember it. Help me. Well, just make those identities up, or are they true? That looks familiar, but I don't know. That looks familiar. So if I look at this one and square both sides. So if I solve for this, I have this. It almost looks like that. It does. Um, we had to multiply, multiply everything by two. two. Multiply everything by two. Four times four. Square. I'm going to replace a with theta. So that means I can substitute that out. So I'm putting in four sine squared of theta over two. That was magic. Trigonometric magic. Right? That's not something I expect you to know. But it's something that can be done, and we just did it. We just did it, and we've got a few minutes to finish. All right? We got here now, two minutes ago, three minutes ago. Three minutes ago. So three minutes ago. Minutes but anyway, that's a perfect square. We can take the square root of it, then we can integrate with a UDU substitution, and we got it. But that was kind of tricky. So you've got to dig deep. In order to handle integrals like this, and I go back into my old trick bag of tricks. Bag of tricks. My bag of trick tricks. Tricky tricks. Okay. I am a